All right. Good evening, everyone. I um I managed to get on to see your feed today. So uh, all of all of you who greeted me last night and welcomed me last night, thank you for that. I didn't see it last night, but uh, I can see you now greeting me, and I, I'm um, delighted to be sharing with you. It's uh, just such a blessing, and and I want to really start by honouring Jari. I think Jari is a genius. The way he has been able to set this up so that uh, we can connect and, and I can share with you in this way is just, uh, he really is a genius. And even even though on this end, David has been a great help, he is, Jari is amazing. So thank you, Jari. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to be able to share with you. And uh, I had the uh, privilege as well to be able to um, to read some of the insights that, that were put up last night. And um, I, I want to thank you. I was so blessed as uh, I read just for some of you who shared very openly and honestly and others who just expressed what you were learning. It really, uh, it really blessed me to hear you engaging with the reality that we live in a world where people experience dark times and it's not because there's something wrong with them or there's some kind of second class person. It's because we're humans. And every now and then we, we go through times that uh, we just can't survive on our own. So where we ended up last night, let me just do a, a really quick run through um, on my screen here. Uh, we called it when fullness fails. The The reason we called it that is because of this amazing, wonderful scripture in John 10.10, 10, as the Passion Translation says it, uh, Jesus saying to us, I have come to give you everything in abundance, life in its fullness, until you overflow. We had a look at how when a thread comes along and uh, kind of attaches itself to us, we can usually manage to brush it off and, and be okay. Sometimes uh, that thread kind of gets fairly thick. And so when we try to get free from it, it's, uh, it's much harder to, to brush it off. And we usually cannot do it by ourselves. We need to call in the cavalry. We need to call in help and ask people who care about us to help us get free from, uh, from that influence. And then we talked about how the enemy's goal is to wrap us in a trap. And once we're wrapped in a trap, we have, and we looked at uh, the three stages of despair that come when we're wrapped in a trap. We have a problem that has no solution. We're trapped in that problem. We can't get out of it because it's our responsibility. And that's when there comes a thought into our minds that there is a solution. And that solution is the whisper into the hidden parts of our heart that suicide is the answer. And... So uh, just continuing on with that, we then looked at the, the fact that what we really need to deal with the false hope that comes when the enemy puts the thought of suicide in our mind, that suicide is some kind of an answer that we can't find anywhere else that when the enemy puts that into our mind, we need to know it's a false hope. And if we're ever going to be help, help anyone who's stuck in that, with that thought in their mind, stuck in the idea that this is the only solution, stuck with the idea that uh, this, there is hope 
by doing that, a false hope. If we're ever going to be able to help people in that situation, we have to understand ourselves what true hope is. And we went through some scriptures uh, last night. We started talking. We looked at Romans 15, uh, 15, 13, uh, wonderful scripture. I pray that God, the source of hope, and that was our key thing. If we really want true hope, there's only one source. Lots of things can give us hope temporarily, but the true source of true hope is God himself. We looked at uh, what Paul says about how we can rejoice in trials because we go through this process. We learn to endure. Endurance develops our character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And even though life brings us little disappointments here and there, the hope, the salvation hope, our confident hope of salvation will never lead us to disappointment. We're talking about the bigger picture because God himself has placed a love in us that's come directly from him. We went, moved on to Romans 8.38 where Paul is able to say to all the believers in Rome and all the believers throughout time, this is something I have a conviction about. He says, I'm convinced nothing can ever separate us from God's love. And all of those things, we read that, that scripture last night. So let's kick it off now. We're still looking at hope. We're still looking at what true hope looks like. And look at this, 2 Corinthians 4 and verses 8 and 9. Look at what Paul says here. He's talking about his own life. It's like Moses and, and, uh, and uh, Elijah and Job and, and Jeremiah that we looked at. They had really dark times. Paul also had some really tough times in his life. Look at it. He talks about being pressed on every side by troubles. That's pretty bad. Pressed on every side by troubles, but not crushed. And he talks about being perplexed, but not driven to despair. You know, we live in a world that is very perplexing. It's very confusing sometimes. Sometimes we have so much information around, we don't know who's telling us the truth. And we live in a world that's like that. So we, we experience what it means to be perplexed, but not driven to despair. We get hunted down, but never abandoned by God. Knocked down, but we are not destroyed. This is Paul sharing a testimony, saying these are the things that I can tell you because I know they've happened to me. I've been through these things. And I can tell you that just how faithful God is, no matter how bad our troubles we don't get crushed. No matter how confusing and perplexing life is, when we don't have to be driven to despair. Even when we're hunted down, we know for sure that we will never be abandoned by God. Even when we're knocked over, we are not destroyed. Wonderful scripture. And you know, we have a a, a different kind of hope as well. And this is the hope that looks beyond this life. 1 Corinthians 15 and 43 says, Our bodies are, will be buried in brokenness, but they're going to be raised in glory. They're buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. So true hope is well able to look beyond today. True hope knows that whatever goes right or wrong in this life, that's not all there is. We have a future hope. Our future goes way beyond whatever's happening to us right now in this moment. Again, a beautiful scripture. And look at this one. So good. 
this hope, writer of Hebrews says, this hope is a strong and a trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Jesus has already gone in there for us. Again, wonderful, wonderful scripture. This hope is a strong and a trustworthy anchor for our souls. Now, for us to really help someone who is losing hope or lost hope, we have to have a good sense of what true hope really is for it to be able to overflow from us to them. Now, I want you, you know, when and this is actually a bad illustration now because we don't go to the bank anymore and we don't have uh, cash money very much anymore. But it used to be that we would uh, uh, invest, we would make deposits in the bank and we would build up our resources by putting them in the bank. Now, all of us make deposits of hope in something or other. Sometimes we put our hope in, and we talked about this last night, sometimes we put our hope in a person, sometimes we put our hope in a relationship, sometimes we put our hope in a business, we put our hope in a, uh, um, all kinds of different things. You know, a young person might put all their hope in a relationship, and then when that relationship doesn't work out, all their investment is gone and the feeling of loss and despair. Now, I have a cousin. I had a cousin. When I was just 21 years old, my cousin was only 19 and he went into town one day and he went to a, a club uh, where, there was a dan where there was dancing. He went there and his girlfriend and he had a fight and he took himself, they, he got very angry, he took himself out of the club, went down stairs to his truck and in his truck he had a rifle. And so in that moment of darkness, my young cousin took out the rifle and blew his brains out. It's a terrible way to say it, but that's what he did. He, in that moment of darkness, he had invested all of his hope in his relationship with this girl. And when that seemed like it was destroyed, then it seemed like all his hope was destroyed. And so the seed that said suicide was a seed that came in and took over in that moment. What a terrible, terrible waste of life. And I know for many of you, you've, you've had the same kinds of experiences. You know someone or you know a family that have been affected in this way. When I first started in ministry, uh, I can remember one time, uh, we lived in Sydney at the time. It was before we moved to Brisbane. And I can remember going for a walk in a particular part of Sydney that's a very, very popular part around Bondi and around the beach. And they have a place there that's called The Gap. And The Gap is just sheer uh, cliff, rock. And uh, it, it became very famous because it, it became a place where people would go and they would jump off to commit suicide. So, so this was many years ago. These days, there's big fences all the way along to prevent people from thinking to even take their life there. But if you jumped over the gap, there's no way in the world that you would, you would just crash down straight into the ocean, but right onto rocks. So it's very, very dangerous. So on this particular day, we were walking, I was walking with a friend, we're walking along and, and we noticed that there was a girl, a young girl, who was, who'd gone outside the safety fence and was sitting on one of the rocks 
out near the edge of the cliff. And uh, we kind of looked and we thought, oh, is she okay? And uh, it was hard to know. Anyway, cut a long story short. Uh, I climbed over the safety fence and I walked out to where this girl was sitting on the rock. And I sat down there with her and I said to her, are you okay? And she said, I want to end my life. And I said to her, why do you want to do that? And she said, oh. And then she says, oh, you're a stranger. I may as well tell you. And she told me the story of how uh, her, her best friend and her best friend's boyfriend had, uh, had, had a fight and they had broken up. And while they had broken up, she had gone out with her best friend's boyfriend. And for her, what that meant was she had slept with him. And now, just a couple of weeks after she's start, she'd been out with him, he has gone back and reconciled with his girlfriend. And so she has kind of lost her friend and lost the boyfriend. And so she had been investing all her hope in a relationship. And when it looked like she'd lost all that investment, her thought was, I may as well end my life. So we sat there and, and we talked. We didn't, not very deeply, she just talked and I listened. And I, I was able to point out to her just a few little things. I was able to point out to her that, that she's young and, you know, there'll be someone else. And I was able to let her know that she was loved. And I, after, after a while, I, I said to her, look, um, I think you should come back in. And she said to me, look, I, I just want to sit here for a little while, but I can, I can promise you I'm not going to jump. And so I gave her a, a card, gave her my details with my phone number, and I said, look, you know, I'm a minister. Uh, I, love, I love Jesus, and I know that he loves you. And uh, if you would like to talk about this anytime, I'd love to talk with you. And she said, um, mm, okay, took my card, and uh, I, I left her there. And I never heard from her again. But I had a con, as I walked away, I, I had a confidence that she was not going to end her life. But she had come right up to that point of being prepared to, or being prepared to think about it. And the reason for it was because she'd invested everything into the hope of a relationship. And that hope was a false hope. Even in a good relationship, it's still a false hope. The only true hope is the hope that we find in our relationship with God. That's the hope that is a strong and a trustworthy anchor for our souls. It holds us when nothing else will. The hope of our salvation, it holds us when nothing else has the power to hold us through every situation. You know, you may, uh, it may be that you uh, deposit all your hope into the success of a business, you know. And again, same sort of thing. If you were, uh, if you were living in America, the chances are you would have a gun in your home. And so when you invest everything into business or into the workplace, and then it goes wrong or it's not successful, then you've invested all your hope in there and suddenly there is no hope. It's a false hope, completely a false hope. Here's something to think about, right? And, and uh, if we'd got through all of this, uh, 
last night, this would have been a bit of an exercise for you to think about uh, at home. But let's just have a look at these things to think about. Just uh, three things. We'll, we'll start the first one. So when the first thread of hopelessness, remember the, the spider web, when the first thread of hopelessness attacks, when it comes to you, just imagine, even tonight, that there's a thread of hopelessness, a hope, something you, you hoped for, that you're disappointed about, that it's just a thread at this stage. What do you do to stop it from sticking? What's something that you would do to stop that first thread of hopelessness from actually coming and sticking itself to you. Okay, there we've got it. Push it, push it away, Lorna says. Pray, Melanie. Wonderful. See, these are uh, remembering the promises of God. These are the things that need to come to our minds straight away. The, maybe there's a particular promise that you love. Shove it away, distract yourself, pray, declare the Lord's truth, brush it off, focus on Jesus. All these things are the exact right thing to do. And uh, I really encourage you to think in terms of a, uh, a, a particular promise that you love, a promise that God has often brought back to your mind. And you know that when you sit with that promise again, you know that whatever it was that was making you feel hopeless, you know that uh, you feel empowered. Remember how um, David in the scriptures, when uh, his men all turned against him after the enemy had come and stolen all their wives and their property and all his, his the army of men um, came and they, they, uh, they were angry with him. They blamed him for it. Where did, what did David do? He went and he strengthened himself in the Lord. <laughs> he knew where to go to get his strength back because what had happened had really uh, discouraged them all. And now everyone had turned against him, so he was, in, uh, he was discouraged. So we've got some great, um, just great words coming through there on the chat. I really appreciate all the things that you're saying. Um, it's it's very uh, good to express these things because you don't know when the time is that you have to reach out again and, and uh, encourage yourself in the Lord and shake off whatever the hopeless situation is. And lots of great ideas there. Of, um, Worshipping and listening to worship songs and warfare, they're all very, very good, very real um, suggestions. So look at number two. When you see not just one thread, but you see a few threads, like a full, um, fairly established spider's web coming at you, and this, you, you, you've kind of walked into it. And it's sticking to you. Who do you go to? We've already looked at how when that happens, you actually need someone else. Who do you go to? I know that you go to God. I know that God is, is the first answer there. But look, I can already see some great answers coming through. Spiritual mentors. People that you trust people in your life that know you and can see you what needs to, can, can see where, where you're being attacked and can speak truth to you and speak hope to you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, spiritual mothers, mentors, it may, for some of you, there may be someone you go to for counsel. 
your pastor. There is a, I, I love the fact that you can answer that question because it's really important to recognize that there are times when no matter how hard I try, I, I just need someone else to pray for me. I need someone I can trust, someone I can go to and just say to them, look, would you please just uh, pray for me? I know it's not that I don't understand. Often I know all the answers, but, it, but knowing the answers doesn't help me get free. Sometimes you just need that friend to get all those little bits of spider web, all those little bits of hopelessness that have started to stick. Someone that you trust. If you're, I, I'm assuming that you all have someone that you trust. And uh, if you don't, let me encourage you tonight to really think through who who it is that you always know that you can go to. I know you can go to your pastors. I know that you probably have wise, that you have wise people in the church that you can talk things through with. It's, uh, yeah, it, it, in your family, in your, um, in your home, you may have people, or it may be a neighbor, it may be someone else, but wise people, close friends in the church, people who know God, it's important that, uh, that we build those kind of relationships. All right, look at the third one. <clears throat> Sorry. Third one. At this stage, we're looking at someone. Now, I want you to imagine that it's you. We're looking at somebody who's wrapped and trapped in despair. Imagine that that was you. What would you need to give you real hope? What is it that could give you real hope? God, Jesus, all of these uh, answers, of course, are where our hope comes from. But this is, a, but I want you to think about this a little bit further. Because if you're wrapped and trapped in despair, it's really hard to hang on to God. And, and, you know, I've seen people so many times trying to hang on to God when they're all wrapped up in hopelessness and they lose the desire even. And so our understanding is really important because it's not our role to hang on to God. God has come to us. God holds on to us. When we were born into his family, we may not have... It's like being born as a child. You know, you don't know who your parents are, but your parents know that this baby belongs to them. And it's the same with us when we are born again. We, we hear all about God, but we don't really know him. But God knows us. God knows that we said that prayer. God knows that we belong to him. God is never going to forget that we belong to him. And he is committed to the journey that we will take as we grow and come to know that this is who our father is. This is his character. This is how trustworthy he is. That God is committed to teaching us. God is committed to this journey. You know, we we lose hope because we, we're not very good at the journey. But it's not our journey. God is the one who's come to us. He knows how to help us grow. He knows how to do what we can't do. So, wrapped and trapped in despair. Mm. This is what I want. This is the, the one key. Now, I, I'm, I'm leaving it with you because I know that you will 
be you will come up with keys yourself. So give me a moment. Here's my illustration. I want you to imagine that you are going into a really hard, dark place, okay? So you've been wrapped and trapped and the way you are looking at life is dark. There's a shade over. You're not seeing things as, it real, as they really are. And you have been wrapped and trapped better put this on, in hopelessness. So this is what it looks like. <clears throat> so I want you to see that my view is dark. I'm in a dark place. Hopelessness has come and taken over my focus. Now, if you, as you look at me like that, you can see that I haven't got a very good view of anything. There's no clarity. I can't see what's going on. But this is how you can help me. You see, even though hopelessness has taken over my perspective, there's still parts of these glasses that I can see out of. And you know, what I need to do to be able to see is I need to look up because the top of my glasses is still, even though it's a little bit dark, it's, it's clear. It's not blanked out like this hopeless section. And you know, when you get to share with somebody, when you come across somebody who is really stuck in hopelessness, the one key that I would put in your mind is the idea that we can get them to look up, all right? Imagine them wearing these glasses, and if they will look up, they can start to be able to see again. Does that make sense to you? I hope that makes sense to you. Um, because that's the way out, true hope, true hope comes from looking up. And so when we go into somebody, go in and see somebody who is, is really uh, uh, in despair and we think, I don't know how to help them. Everything looks so black through their eyes. There will be somewhere in their glasses where it's not as black as other places. And so when we go as God's messenger, we're looking for those places where we can help them look up. Because if they look up, then when we speak the love of God to them and speak the scriptures to them, they just may start being able to hear what it is. Looking up, very simple, but if you can keep that in your mind, when you're talking to someone and they feel so hopeless, that I hope it will come into your mind, this picture of these glasses, with hopelessness written across and the idea, let's look up. Let me help you look up. Let's talk about things that will help you look up. All right. Now, what we uh, are doing right now is we're actually coming to session two. And, and session two is first session we looked at the idea, one of the threads of being hopelessness. Second session, I'm looking at a different thread. I said we were going to look at three threads. And this is the second thread that, uh, that I wanted to look at. But before I do, let me just say, worldwide statistics would say that between, uh, in the past 24 hours, globally, it's likely that approximately 1,000 people will have committed suicide. 
All right, now, I don't know how they get those statistics, but that's the statistic. Approximately 1,000 people in 24 hours globally will take their own life. And uh, the reality is some of those people will be born again Christians. I, I, I know that, that is so sad, but it's true. Some of those people will be born again Christians and uh, they're the ones that uh, we, we want to be able to help. I mean, we want to be able to help everyone. But when we see a born again Christian losing hope, that's even sadder because they, they're in a relationship with the God who is the source of all hope. So the second thread that leads people on this terrible journey towards this terrible lie of thinking that it would be better to take my own life than to stay here in the circumstances that I'm currently facing. And it's loneliness. Loneliness. Aloneness, emotional isolation. One of the strongest reasons for deep pain in a person's life, even for people of faith, one of the strongest reasons for pain is the sense to feel alone. That, alone. that aloneness may come from a broken relationship. And you may feel alone because you've lost connection with with your family or you've lost connection, or you've lost a marriage or, or you've lost a friend uh, or maybe you've lost a loved one. But it's the idea of, that you, of feeling incredibly alone is one of those threads that can come and everyone experiences it, times where you, you feel alone and you might be able to brush it off or it might be a bit harder or you may get wrapped in the trap of feeling alone and uh, feeling it, it taking you on that path to despair. Now, many years ago, Larry Crabb wrote a book. It was called The Safest Place on Earth. It was a book about the church. And in it, he starts off in his introduction by talking about a picture of uh, of a beach, and uh, on the beach, you know, all these all these chairs that you can go and sit on at the beach, and and uh, he points out that they're all facing the ocean. Well, that kind of makes sense to us, but looking at that picture, all the chairs are facing out to the ocean, and uh, in in the book, he he comments about how. So many times, so many people, even in the church, we live our lives facing out to the ocean instead of facing each other. And that's his point, you know. We're not meant to be isolated. We're not meant to be having a, 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 a range of vision that doesn't have anybody in it. We're not meant to have that emotional isolation. We're, we're community creatures. We're born into a family. We're meant to have uh, relationships where our needs are met and we meet the needs of others. And, uh, and that aloneness doesn't rule our lives because we have connection. And uh, we, we true, we need people uh, that comment absolutely we need people so this picture of um that larry crab uses in his book i i really like it because you look at that and it just seems like all these people close together but not connected and he he talks about how we need to turn our chair and, and he's talking about turning our lives, but, but the image is to turn our chair in such a way that we're facing other people. And that's the equivalent of saying we need to be sharing our life 
with others. If I'm facing you, you can get to know me and I can get to know you. But if I'm only ever facing out to the ocean, then it's like, it's like having uh, barriers uh, around me and you can't get to me and I, I don't take an interest in you. We're not meant to live like that. That's just wrong. So when we do live like that, it's sad. When we do live like that, it's, it's, it's overwhelming. And uh, the problem becomes a really big problem when we start to really struggle. You know, the thread comes, gets stronger, the wrapping starts to take place, and we are really struggling with feeling alone, even though we're part of the church, or even though we're surrounded by people, we're feeling really alone and struggling. And what we do, we don't tell anyone. We hide it. And uh, we hide it away on the inside where it really hurts and it grows deeper and stronger and starts to get a, starts to wrap around our heart. Have a look at uh, Galatians chapter 6 and reading verses 2 through 5. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else. For we are each responsible for our own conduct. Now this is an incredible passage that gives us a, an incredible balance. Because there's two areas. First of all, it, it makes clear Everybody carries their own load. Everybody Hello? is responsible. Hello. Everybody is responsible for their own life. At the same time, we support one another because when we support one another, it makes whatever we have to go through bearable. All right, so that, that scripture, let me, uh, let me just go back to it again with that in mind. We share each other's burdens and obey the law of Christ. So we share the burdens that each one carries and it makes, uh, it, it shares the load. But that doesn't mean that everybody is responsible for my burden. When I share my burden, I am responsible for my conduct. I am responsible for how I live and how I behave and the actions I take. But when I, get, when I can share it and share with you my mistakes and share with you my victories and share with you uh, how I'm feeling, then it doesn't feel so heavy for me. It doesn't mean you're responsible. I'm responsible, but it helps me to unload. And I'm not just unloading onto you, I'm unloading onto the Lord, but he's given you to me to help me. Yeah, a listening ear, so important. So this is the thing, this is the balance of what is our personal responsibility and what is our corporate responsibility. Everyone carries their own load. You know, when somebody makes a foolish decision, they have to carry the consequences of that. But in sharing it, I can be there to support them, not because I, I agree with their decision. They may have made a foolish decision, but I, it's not about their decision. I'm supporting them. This is the balance of personal responsibility that I carry, but the corporate responsibility of supporting one another in our human frailty, because that's all that we are. We're human and we're frail. 
And uh, if I if I came to teach you tonight, right? And uh, and I looked like this. I know what you would do. First of all, you would be very curious. You would all want to know what happened. You would, you would be saying, Mum Helen, what happened to your hand? If I came with my hand bandaged like that, you would come up and you would say, uh, what happened? And uh, you, you, wouldn't, you, you wouldn't want me to start teaching. You would first want to know what happened because, because it's obviously there's pain there. And uh, you, you, you would be curious, but you would want to help me. You would encourage me. You would pray for me. You would pray with me because obviously I'm in pain, right? And you know, if that was my hand, I wouldn't hesitate to tell you what had happened. I'd tell you how much it hurt uh, and I would want you to help me. I would want you to pray for me. And we would share the reality of that. But the thing is, when it's this, when it's a broken heart, when there's a part of me that feels like it's falling apart, but it's not wrapped up for everyone to see, it's on the inside. So often, so often we don't share it. We're afraid of that judgment. We're afraid of what others will think of us. And yet if that's the reality of what's happening on the inside, we are in a process of being wrapped and trapped in an isolation. We call it loneliness, but an, an isolated place that uh, is just very, very painful. And when you get isolated enough, then the enemy comes with his solution to our pain and suggests that it would be a good thing for us to end our life. And if we've hidden it all away, then it's, uh, we are very open to that voice that is a false voice, a false solution. Just like it was false hope, this is a false solution. Isolation is a, a terrible, uh, terrible disease. It's a terrible feeling that, uh, that we can get stuck in. If I can sit down with someone and just say, you know what? I'm feeling lonely. I know I've got people around me, but I'm feeling lonely. And I feel sad. And I don't know how to get out of it. And sometimes I feel like despair just wants to take over. If I can talk that way without fearing that you're going to judge me or you're going to uh, reject me because of that, or laugh at me, then that means that I, I can start to learn to trust you. Yeah. And learning to trust somebody is very important in this. It's as simple as this, to avoid Satan's trap in this area, to avoid isolation, a person needs to be able to share their burden and be accepted. When loneliness hits, if you fear it and hide it, it can lock you into the trap. If you face it and fight it, you will certainly win. Now, I'm not going to uh, 
I'm not going to go into uh, the, the facing it and fighting it because God has given us all the weapons that we need to outwit the enemy. But I know that you're doing a course on spiritual warfare, so you know that already. And you know what those weapons are. Um, but that's, it's that simple, just that simple page, you know, when loneliness really hits. And, and I'm, I'm talking about it to you because I want you to have an understanding of it. But at the same time, I want you to be thinking out there of others. That person out there who hides themselves, who stays away, you know, they're feeling something that they're afraid of and so they hide it. If they be willing to fight with you, then they can fight it and they will certainly win. Because loneliness, just like despair, it does not, like hopelessness, it doesn't come from God. God has called us into relationship. He is a communal God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, it's a community. And uh, without a doubt. And, and I, I just want to diverge a little bit for a moment because um, we're, we're not just talking about ourselves. We're talking about how we as God's people might be able to reach out and, and intervene in, uh, in somebody else's story. And, be, and for that, as the church, as his church, as the family of God, in recognizing that, that we're hurt and broken, but others around us, they're all hurt and broken too. And we, we're acknowledging that, you know. There are scars in my life because of sins from the past. We all have a sin-scarred life. And that's why we love God, because he has brought us to a place of rest and redemption. That's the gift of what he's, what he's done for us. 2 Corinthians 16. You can put it, someone can put it in the chat because I haven't actually got it uh, on a screen. But 2 Corinthians 16 and 17, you see, God has shown us grace. In our brokenness, he's been kind to us. In our um, uh, pain, he's been comforting. In our... Uh, um, sin, our mistakes, our failures. He's been forgiving. He's been like that to us. And he's been like that to us, shown us his grace to empower us to be able to give that to other people so that when we see their brokenness, we can be kind to them. And when we see that they're hurting, we can give comfort to them. And when we see that they've got scars in their life because of their sin, then we can be forgiving towards them because that's what God has done for us. That's what we've experienced from him. And so we reach out in his name. And 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 16 and 17, it says, So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. We have stopped. That's the scripture. We have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. If you've been a Christian for a long time, you've heard that verse many, many, many times. And I've heard it many, many, many times. And you know, it's still, it's beautiful. Such a beautiful word. God saying, look, I know what you're really like. 
and I've been kind to you in your brokenness. I've been comforting to you in your pain, healing towards you in your pain. I've been forgiving towards you in the scars that have come from the way you lived, your selfishness. I've been like that to you. And now I see you as a new creation. And now, as a church, when you look at others, you give away what I've given to you. You give that same heart to the people around you that you've experienced from me. You know, I, I love how the caress us. You know, I, I, um, I know sometimes we people have grown up with the, uh, with the picture. Oh, my goodness, I've just looked at the time. People have grown up with the picture in their mind of uh, uh, God as a policeman. And, and when we do something wrong, there's this big finger that's pointing at us and, and uh, kind of pressing at, uh, and, and saying things uh, that, that are unkind. God has never been like that. When he comes to us, he corrects us through love. He leads us to repentance. His kindness leads us to repentance. He is amazing. And he doesn't change. He's not pointing a finger one day and then kind the next day, and you're never quite sure what you're going to get which God you're going to get. There is only one God and his character is always the same. And the more we experience that ourselves, the, the more strength we have and the more we are empowered and the more authority we have to reach out to others and let them know that this is who God truly is. He's not a God that would ever leave you alone. And I was uh, just, I was going to have a little look at something else, but there's really not time. So, uh, so let me uh, finish up. I'll, I'll uh, run off some to hear, something to think about. Thinking about loneliness, thinking about this whole thread that comes either as a single thread that we can break off or as a heaviness that we actually need others to help us with or something we, we can actually get trapped into. So think about it. What does it look like to be a welcoming person? So I'm not talking about welcoming people. I mean being a welcoming kind of person. A welcoming kind of person is not the person who's just on duty on a Sunday. I'm talking about a welcoming kind of person who is a welcoming kind of person when they're at home. They're a welcoming kind of person when they're at work. They're a welcoming kind of person when uh, they go out. They're a welcoming kind of person wherever they are and whatever they're doing and whether they've got a responsibility or not. They are just a welcoming kind of person. And uh, I already love that an open person, someone with a good heart. Um, and uh, needing to work on it. That's, that's my second thing to think about here. Number two is that question, how can I be more welcoming? And again, I'm not talking about how can I be more welcoming when I'm on duty on a Sunday at church. I'm talking about a world where people around us are really struggling with loneliness and isolation. How can I be more of a welcoming person as I interact with people? Because I don't know where they're at. I don't know if they're happy or sad and unless I know them personally. Often I'm, I, you don't know what's going on on the inside of a person and it just may be that the inside of the person may look like this. So if that were the case, how can I grow to be more of a welcoming person for that person? 
And here's the third question for you to think about. Wrapped and trapped in despair. And the despair this time is not hopelessness. The despair we're talking about is aloneness, isolation. How can I feel safe again? How can I help someone to feel safe? Okay, there's some good thoughts coming through there. Be a good listener. That's a good uh, response. How can I help someone who is wrapped and trapped to feel safe again? Be a companion. That's, uh, again, a great, a great thought, a great idea. Let's go just quickly uh, go back to our three threads, not threads, our spider's web, right? So when, the, when, there's, uh, when a person is, is suffering from loneliness, uh, if it's just a single thread, then they can probably start thinking, oh, maybe I, I, I won't just sit here and wait and think about it. I should ring, I'll ring Lorna because I know Lorna, so I'll ring her. Or I'll ring, I'll, I'll uh, make contact with Melanie, I'll see if Melanie's got time to have a coffee with me. So you can kind of shake it off when it just starts. But if it's kind of getting a hold of you and you're feeling really alone and your mind is starting to go into a, a heavier place, where it's not just, I'm all alone, you start thinking, well, nobody likes me. That's why I'm alone. Nobody wants to be with me. So that's when we come in to be a companion. That's where we come in to listen and to allow the person to say what's really going on, how they're really feeling, without condemning them, without passing judgment, but allowing them just to share it so that uh, even though they're responsible for, for their actions and the words that they're saying, you're you can give support to them so that they can recognize that the way they're feeling is not the way they have to stay. It's not the place that they have to stay in. And then the wrapped and trap, when the enemy has truly wrapped somebody up and they are truly feeling isolated, feeling that nobody cares, feeling that if they did commit suicide, nobody would miss them. Nobody would, uh, everybody would be better off without them. That, that person we need to we need to recognize this again this time it's not hopelessness that's taking over their vision, but it's loneliness. And if you look at my sign this time, there's spaces where you can come in. And even though loneliness is wrapping me up, there's places where you can come in and choose to be with me. And that's the key with someone where loneliness is taking over. The key the key is being able to look for the places in their life where you can just be with them. Look, um, we are well and truly out of time and you've got another class coming, coming.
coming on straight away. I have uh, goes so quickly, goes so quickly. Um, I, I love some of the things, I love the things that are coming through on your chat that uh, it, it just really fills my heart because I can see that, that you're catching, that you, you really have an understanding of how important um, it is to value people. And even though a person might be in a place where they're really being trapped and in a very dark place, that doesn't take away their value. In God's eyes, they're still totally valuable. So God has said, no matter how strong your loneliness, God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. And with that, we will celebrate. Um, I will go back to a couple of the things which are really just stuff that if you've heard me teach on, uh, on freedom prayer, then um, you know that, that when we talk about um, there, there's some, some ways to look at the heart. And uh, one of the key, the reason why I, I'm, I want to include this is because this is actually very, um, what can I say? It's, it's helpful in a practical way. So let me go through this fairly quickly. We're trying to stop loneliness. When we look at our heart, when, when we talk with a person and we look and we get to hear their heart, we often hear one of two things. We hear that the, the heart is really hurting or bruised, or we hear that the heart is really blackened from sin. So we talk about a bruised heart or a blackened heart. A bruised heart is bruised because it's been hurt. Somebody's kicked it. A blackened heart is black from choices the person has made themselves of sin. So bruised or blackened. Bruised heart, somebody kicked them at a heart level. The blackened heart, they made some bad choices and sin has left an impact in the heart. Now, bruised or blackened, remember, this is the heart we're talking about, so nobody out there can see what it looks like on the inside. But when we sit with someone and they begin to share their heart, we begin to see what it looks like. We begin to see if the, the things that they're struggling with are coming because of bruising in their heart, because life and people have kicked them and got them real and, and that's the pain they feel or we can come to understand that they've made some choices they've that are sin choices and that some of the things they struggle with are a result of their own sin so that's the so we're looking at what do you do when you're sitting with somebody and you realize that their heart is bruised other people have done things to them that have really damaged them and they can't get over it. Here's the strategy, A, B, C, and uh, some of you will have heard me teach this before, but it's so helpful. I use it all the time, A, B, C. How do you, how do you bring a heart to God to get healing? A, B, C. In, the person needs to acknowledge the depth of the hurt. You know, if, I, if um, somebody hurts me and I say, oh, I know I have to forgive, so I forgive. That, I can forgive and forgive and forgive. Very often it just doesn't work. What I need to do is be able to open up my heart and acknowledge that what that person did really hurt. I am hurting on the inside because of that. I don't hate them. I, I'm not angry with them anymore. I've dealt with all of those things. But the inside of me was really hurt. 
So first, acknowledge the depth of the hurt. B, bring that hurt to God. Bring it to God and know that Jesus took it on the cross. So that hurt doesn't have to stay sitting in my heart, damaging my heart. I can bring it to God knowing that Jesus took it on the cross. And C, choose to forgive. As modelled by Jesus on the cross, when Jesus died on the cross, he absolved the people of, uh, of their sin. So, A, B, C, acknowledge the depth of the hurt. B, bring the hurt to God. C, choose to forgive. Close off by praying for you. Father, I thank you for the, uh, just the, the freedom we have and the wonderful access we have, the way you've given us your word. You've given us your word so we can learn from your word. You've given us your word so that we can see who you are and know your character. You've given us your word so that we can be free and so that we can have life. Lord, we thank you that you are the living word. Father, I thank you that you love each one of us. You will never leave us. You will never abandon us. And you love us when we're feeling a bit isolated, a bit lonely. You love us when we're struggling with various things. You love us when we're wrapped and trapped. We are valuable in your eyes, regardless of what's happening in our lives. So, Lord, would you work in us? tonight and help us to be empowered and anointed in telling the, the world the wonderful news that you really care. You really care. And not only that, but you're, you're able to heal every hurt. You're able to free every captive. You are able. You are more than able. We love you, Lord. So let your blessing be on these, uh, each, each one who's been part of this class with us tonight. Thank you so much, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.